Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Gibson. Dr. Mitchell Gibson is one of the world's leading authorities on the interface of science, the human soul, and the frontiers of human consciousness. He's the best-selling author of Your Immortal Body of Light, Signs of Mental Illness, Signs of Psychic and Spiritual Ability, The Living Soul, and Ancient Teaching Stories. And I've read a couple of his books um, this week in advance of the interview, so I'm excited to ask him about them. He's delivered addresses to many of the world's largest conferences related to science and consciousness. These include the International Science and Consciousness Conference, the Sivananda Ashram Annual Symposium, International Institute of Integral Human Sciences, the SGGRIT Conference on Advances in Electronic Medicine in Italy, and many, many more. Now, Dr. Dr. Gibson's been a consultant for Fortune 500 companies, Hollywood celebrities, professional athletes, and the AE Network, NBC, ABC, and many others. His website is www.tybro.com that's t-y-b-r-o.com do check out his website there's a lot of very interesting information on there well dr mitchell gibson welcome to the show <laughs> thank you well it's wonderful to have you with us as i said in the introduction i i learned of your work when i read your your book, Signs of Mental Illness. And then I ordered a copy of the second one, Signs of, of Spiritual and Psychic Abilities. And I was, as an astrologer, I was fascinated by everything you had to share. But I want to ask you, first of all, Dr. Gibson, to tell us a little bit about your, your, your history, because I know that you're also a psychiatrist. That's right. That's right. I um, <clears throat> grew up in the deep rural South in the Bible Belt of the United States, <clears throat> and my initial upbringing was actually fairly religious, very conservative, very uh, religious-based, but I asked a lot of the wrong questions when I was a child. I asked about warfare in the Bible. I asked about um, <clears throat> the church being the sponsor for the Crusades. I didn't, I didn't really understand why there would be so much bloodshed and a foundation that was essentially the spiritual center for the world. My pastors didn't like that, my mother didn't like that, but it really began uh, a, a deep spiritual journey that led me to look into, I mean, a number of the world's religions. It led me to look into how the planet functions on a spiritual basis. And as luck would have it, when I was about 12 years old, <clears throat> A monk came to my middle school, and this was quite an event because my middle school was in a town called Ellerby, North Carolina, which is in the middle of the Deep South. So why a Buddhist monk was in the Deep South, a black school, an African-American school, I would never know. But he introduced meditation, and that changed my entire life. From that point on, I delved deeply into meditation. Uh, I studied Maharishi Mayas Yogi and Transcendental Meditation and a number of different other types. And I found that if I meditated in a certain way, I could leave my body. And at first I thought I had died because I was floating on the ceiling and I could look back and see my body and I thought everybody could do this. And at being an adolescent, the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to go see all the pretty girls in the neighborhood. So I did. But later I found that there were more useful applications that I could have for being able to travel out of my body. And it began a lifelong journey of exploration and meditation and it led me to medicine and ultimately it led me to um, exploring the spiritual world. Well, it's exciting to speak to somebody who's so well qualified in psychiatry but who also is very open to metaphysics. I, I often find with some clients that it's difficult to distinguish the extent to which they may be experiencing some spiritual problems uh, and distinguishing that from the potential for mental illness. So I want to ask you, Dr. Gibson, I know we're going to talk about signs of spiritual and psychic ability, but I wanted to ask a little bit about mental illness because that was the first of your books that I read. How did you discover that you could use astrology 
to to determine a predisposition towards mental illness? When I was in my residency, um, I was elected chief resident my senior year uh, of training. And the chief resident is the person that fills out the call schedule for all the other residents in the hospital in that area. Well, everybody, uh, I, I quickly noticed that everybody wanted to avoid being on call anywhere near the full moon. And it was such a, a big deal that they would try to bribe you so they wouldn't be on call the day before, the day over, the day after the full moon. And it was really funny to see doctors, well-educated people from Harvard, Stanford, Yale, people like that, places like that say, oh, God, Mitch, don't put me on call anywhere near there. And so it, it really raised my curiosity level. What the heck is going on with the full moon? And I did some research. Uh, actually, admissions to the hospital went up on the full moon. Um, the severity of su suicide attempts was greater on the full moon. Also, um, there were more calls to the ER on the full moon. So you just had a busier time when you're on call, if you're on call around that time. And so when I got into private practice, I extended my search into this, into um, whether or not, well, is it just a full moon effect or is there an effect associated with the time that you're born and the risk for having mental illness? Well, nobody had ever done that research before. And it was something, I, there was nothing written about it, basically, except that there was a full moon effect and that there were certain, there was a little bit of research done on schizophrenia um, and the season a person was born, but nobody had ever looked at the five major diagnoses of mental illness and astrological signs associated with them. And so in, in completing that work, I went over over 400 different uh, patients' charts um, and I looked over hundreds of people from different time periods. And in doing that, I found that you really couldn't see the patterns in traditional astrology. You had to look into right ascension declination astrology to see the patterns. And essentially, you had to look at the three-dimensional patterns of how the planets move. Well, when you did that, the patterns became very apparent. And that's how the book uh, came to be. And I won a number of awards for that research. And it's something that I still use to this day. Every time um, I have a client, I will refer back to my astrology program to help read them. It's fascinating. And I know that most astrologers, when they look at the natal chart, they're looking in effect at the distance between the planets in terms of longitude. And so I, I, I always picture that natal chart as a circle. But then mm -hmm. you spoke of declination. So the the where the planet is actually located in, in, in terms of the equator. And so really understanding a person's soul or their psyche through astrology is more like looking at a cylinder than looking at a circle. Actually, I see it more as a sphere. Okay. So that there is the, of course, the longitudinal aspects of the trines and sextiles, etc. But there's also eclipses, there are also triangles, there are uh, combinations of planetary movements that work in three dimensions as well as two dimensions. When you add that third dimensional component, that's when you can see the patterns of mental illness and also psychic ability. Well, and I, we're going to talk about it much more. It's so interesting. I, I wanted to ask you a question about eclipses, actually, because I was doing some work looking at uh, mass murderers and serial killers. And I noticed in the case of serial killers that they were often born under a Sun-Venus eclipse. Mm -hmm. Have you discovered that? And can you explain why that might be? Because it, it seems almost counterintuitive. Uh, the first, ironically that you would ask that question, the first research that I did on uh, mental illness was actually done with mass murders and serial killers. And I went back until the 1500s, until the 21st century, looking at mass murders and serial killers and their uh, astrological combinations of signs. Um, Lois Rodden did a book uh, on mass murders, serial killers, rapists, and criminals. And she did probably the seminal work on uh, that type of personality. <clears throat> and I met with her before she passed and talked with her about her research. And 
when I did that, <clears throat> I went over probably three-fourths of the people in that book. And the thing that I found to be most common, and, and I put it through the, the work, the research that I had, is I found that there were changes in the planet Pluto and the planet Neptune in association with Mars and killing. I did see the initial changes with Sun, with uh, the Sun and Venus, but as I looked deeper, I saw that Mars and Pluto and Neptune, had, especially Neptune and Mars, had more changes than the initial Sun Venus. And I often think to myself, when I analyze these charts, these people, and you can see through the, the natal astrology, particularly when you look at the declinations, you can see the mm -hmm. complexity and the potential for problems. But how do we explain that that particular person goes down the path of, of severe crime as opposed to other people that were born around the same time? Well, <clears throat> there is a concept of nature versus nurture. Um, <clears throat> You can have a person, and you can apply this also to psychic ability as well, and mental illness. You can have two people that have very similar charts and proclivities towards certain problems. But if those people are raised in environments that are more nurturing, that parents are better parents or better environments, those tendencies tend not to come out as much. But when you look at the people that had the signs and then have the childhood abuse and childhood difficulties that would make this more likely that the signs would come out. Then you start seeing the strength of the predictive value of the, the charts. So that, for instance, if you look at a person like Gary Heidnick, um, Gary Heidnick had an awful childhood. And he's one of the people that they make horror movies about. And when he was a very young kid, his mother uh, killed his pet dog in front of him with an ax. And it's that kind of thing that became part of his childhood. Well, a normal person that has the same sort of um, uh, aspects in their chart, but they don't have that abuse, is less likely to have those same things come out to that same degree. So the context of the, the upbringing and environment is the determining factor. It definitely is a factor. It, it, okay. If you have the signs, it's not enough just to have the signs. You have to have something to trigger them. Okay. But what we could do potentially is look at somebody that has already committed a crime and consider whether whether they have the potential to commit far worse or more crimes. Right. There are some aspects, though, that I found that it, it doesn't matter what your parenting is. There are some aspects that are so powerful that if you have them, it's, it's almost a fait complete that these things are going to manifest in your life, either directly or indirectly. And I call those extreme declinations or extreme signs where uh, the planet Mars or the planet Venus, and especially as Moon and Mars are together in an area beyond 23, 23 degrees, 30 minutes, north or south declination. When they go, especially if they go to a 24 or 25 degrees, those are real danger areas that really destabilize the psyche. Uh, that's because the archetype of the planet loses control when it goes beyond 23 degrees. Is that correct? That's right. That's what that would. That's my theory. Okay. And, and then also, I noticed it's, it's, it's fascinating like that you, all this work that you've done on declinations I found incredible because it caused me to look at the movement of the planets and particularly the declinations of the planets as they move up and um, below the equator. But to look at those in terms of world events, Dr. Gibson, and I found that when Pluto reaches its most extreme declination and when it crosses the equator, that there are huge world events such as Great War. And I was intrigued by this crossing of the equator, that as well as the extreme declination, that when a planet crosses the equator, there's some kind of effect there as well. Did you find that, for example, Mars next to the moon on the equator is a destabilizing factor within a person as well? Well, the equator is one of the nodal areas that causes manifestation of the energy of a planet. So uh, I, when I look at a person's chart, I look at three areas. 
I look at an area um, uh, near the ecliptic, near where the planets uh, cross the plane of orbit in the sky, in, in the imaginary sky. Um, there is no plane there, but in, if you look at it imaginarily, you can definitely mathematically extend that plane uh, infinitely, and all the planets will eventually cross that at one time or another. I also look at an area uh, that's uh, 21 degrees to 23 degrees, 30 minutes. That's called high declination, and that's in the north and south part of the sky. Look at those three areas first. And those are the areas where things tend to manifest the most. And when Pluto goes there, when Mars goes there, when Neptune goes there, but particularly when Saturn goes there with any other planet, it causes things to crystallize in the world. And when you get a lot of planets in that area, you'll find that that's when the world wars happen, that's when large pandemics happen, uh, that's when major world um, earthquakes happen. It's as though those energies beam down in a much larger sense in a smaller area like our Earth. And you just really see that over and over when you look at the charts of those major events. You'll see these planets strong like uh, pearls on a chain in these danger areas, in these high activity areas. It's incredible, isn't it? How the, it's incredible how when we look at metaphysics, so beyond physics or beyond the physical and the commonly accepted understanding of science, we can see so much. Well, it, it's interesting what's going on now with science in that scientists are now understanding that from the quantum level, nothing exists until you look at it. They also understand that there's no such thing as a separate reality from consciousness. So it really supports the, the concept that planetary movements, observation, consciousness are all linked at some hidden level that we're just beginning to explore. It used to be that the Newtonian concepts of reality ruled what we thought was real. We thought with well, a planet, you know, 10 billion miles away, how it's going to affect anything on Earth? Well, we now understand that it doesn't matter how far away one particle is from another. If they become entangled in space and time and in consciousness, they can affect each other instantaneously. Well, oddly enough, that tends to support astrology. But that is the height of quantum physics, which is as far removed from astrology as you can get, except that they are linked. Do you find there's much resistance in the medical world or the world of psychiatry to your use of astrology? You know, um, some of the, the greatest, astrolog uh, greatest astrologers in the world were also psychiatrists. Carl Jung and later in his life Sigmund Freud all used all used astrology. It was um, Carl Jung's writing about astrology that really influenced me to start using it. And there are still a lot of psychiatrists that were trained analytically and trained in some of the older schools that accept the use of astrology in certain contexts with clients. Now, of course, there's a lot of people that look at it as hokey and things that uh, you know border on witchcraft. But there's a surprising number of open-minded psychiatrists that say, you know, I've seen a lot in my practice, things that seem crazy, and if you have an explanation for it, uh, they listen. Because psychiatry is one of those things that you have to have an open mind to open your practice every day. You really do. You must have seen so much in your, in your practice. Well, I wanted to ask you, before we talk about signs of spiritual abilities, I wanted to ask you another question about mental illness. Okay. And I wanted to be quite specific. So I was wondering if you could give us a specific example about maybe the distinguishing aspects in astrology between somebody that suffers severely from ADD, for example, and somebody that is that has a severe form of bipolar disorder. I know from a couple of friends that it's often very difficult to distinguish between severe ADD and, and bipolar disorder. And I, I wondered if there's any insight astrologically that can help to answer that question. My research hasn't studied bipolar disorder as of yet. Um, bipolar disorder is kind of a... Um, a difficult diagnosis because it tends to run with so many other problems. People that are bipolar very quickly find ways to self-medicate, for instance. So quite often they have a comorbid state with alcohol or drug abuse. And so 
um, it was kind of a dirty diagnosis, and I tended to stay away from it in the research because I wanted to find people who were either depressed or drug addicts, but not doing both. And with attention deficit disorder, it tends to strike younger people, though it can extend into adulthood. And I wanted to, when that research, I only researched kids who are 18 and under. We'll start with, if you start with attention deficit, I primarily saw that there were planetary movements or groups of planetary movements that were reflective of Uranus, Neptune, and Saturn movements that occurred in these folks about 200% more than you would expect by chance. So that quite often if a person had ADD, you would see a Uranus-Neptune or a Saturn-Uranus-Neptune binary eclipse, which is not a common thing. And another thing that you would see is you would see um, Pluto and Neptune uh, in trine or in combination with other planets in a way that you just don't see in other diagnoses. And with um, some of the diagnoses I saw with depression, even though we didn't look at bi uh, bipolar, but with just unipolar depression, and the thing that you saw most commonly is a Saturn-Pluto uh, eclipse or a Saturn-Pluto parallel, which was over 640% more common in these folks. So now when I look at a person's chart and I see a Saturn-Pluto parallel, Saturn-Pluto eclipse, or a Neptune uh, Mars parallel, which was the three main ones, it tells me something about how likely they are to be suicidal, how likely they are to be depressed, and how severe the depression or su suicidality might be. Wow. It's just, it's so, it's so exciting to hear somebody so well qualified in the, the medical field using this metaphysical knowledge and system to help people to understand what's actually going on and enable them to find solutions. I do want to ask you, Dr. Gibson, we know that there are often spiritual problems as well. So we know that spirits, lower energies do sometimes go after people that are vulnerable. Have you ever, or can you give us an example uh, without breaching confidentiality, of course, but can you give us an example of a time when you've worked with a, a client and felt, hold on, there's more than uh, a mental illness here. There's some kind of spiritual influence or possession. One of the first times that I saw that to be true, I was working actually in an emergency room um, in Pennsylvania. And there was a young man that came in who was a student at a large university. Let's say it's Penn. It wasn't Penn, but let's just say it was Penn. And he was an engineering major. And he came in because his family was concerned because he felt that he was a computer from 500 years in the future. And that the consciousness he had as, had as a 19-year-old had left him and that all that was left was a 500-year advanced computer from the future. And so I said, okay, let me just spend some time with him. And he started telling me about world events, about things that were going to happen in the future. He started telling me about things that eventually did happen. And I thought to myself, either he's a very extraordinary psychic or there's something going on here that Haldol's not going to cure. And so I, I did medicate him because he was having difficulty integrating the processes that were causing him to see into this future state. But as I talked with him, he started making machine sounds. Now, human beings can't make machine sounds uh, when you're talking to them. It sounded like there were gears coming out of his, talk, his speech as he was talking. And it was just the, the doggondest thing I'd ever seen. And it, it, it really showed me that there were levels of perception and consciousness that as a psychiatrist, if I just stayed on the traditional course of psychiatry, I would have medicated him out of his mind, put him in an institution, and he wouldn't have troubled anybody else. But I chose not to do that. I chose to talk with him and look at the problem as it presented and found that there was a perceptive gate that was open inside of him that should not have been open. And to make a long story short, when we closed the gate, it closed not only the 
access he had to that computer, but also some other entities that had come in that were making him seem psychotic. And as long as he did the things that I taught him to keep that date, that gate closed, he was able to finish his engineering degree, was able to marry, move on, move on with his life. Wow, it's a wonderful success story. It doesn't always happen like that, but once in a while it does. Yeah, it makes makes me wonder if many of the people that were locked up in psychiatric institutions perhaps had spiritual problems that were maybe not understood at the time or by the person that was treating them. When I first began working um, as an independent practitioner after uh, finishing my residency, um, I had a certain degree of spiritual vision then. I have more now. But then I noticed that with my just even my primitive spiritual vision, I could see colors. I could see entities around people that were very much like what they were describing. But at that time in my life, I couldn't say anything about it. So I watched them. We would talk about their entity. We talk about their quote unquote psychoses. But I discovered that most of them weren't really psychotic at all. I discovered that there were areas in their consciousness that were open that really should not have been open. And most of them had been opened by drugs or alcohol or trauma or genetic disturbances. And they had no way of closing them, no way of dealing with the um, consciousness uh, disturbances that they had. And the only thing that they could do was say they're hearing voices and seeing things. But it was something more profound and in many ways something almost beautiful except there was a tragic element in that if they presented to someone who could not experience what they were experiencing, they were just going to be medicated and put away. Wow. Well, you do incredible work. I, I want to ask you also about your, your work on signs of spiritual ability. Can you start to tell us a little bit about that, Dr. Gibson, before we take a short break and then come back to the discussion? The second book that I completed on this research uh, was one that I truly enjoyed, and it had to do with looking at a central question, because a, a lot of people that I talked to wanted to know if they had spiritual abilities, what kind of abilities were they born with? And using the same or similar algorithm, I applied uh, a computer algorithm to looking at a person's birth data and psychic ability. So I gathered a database uh, again, from Lois Rodden's brilliant research and some other research. And I looked at uh, probably about 350 to 400 people who were spiritually gifted in several areas, uh, mystical ability, psychic ability, uh, healing potential, and also mediumship. And in that, I compared it to a database of people who didn't really display anything that we would call spiritual abilities. And the algorithms uh, chewed out about 30 different things that were specific to spiritual ability in people born at certain times. Didn't really have anything to do with a person's um, astrological sign, like if you were Virgo or uh, Aries, that, that didn't really hold. But what really held were individual planetary movements and groups of planetary movements based on the three-dimensional sky. When you started looking at those, the computer could pick out a range of potentials that a person would have for displaying abilities. And that became the basis for the work in the second book. And what did you find to be the most prominent indicators of mediumship, for example? Mediumship is sort of a funny gift. Um, mediumship has to do with the ability to communicate with different levels of consciousness. And there are many levels of consciousness that in physics they say it takes 11 dimensions of reality for reality to make sense. Well, when we looked at mediumship and some of the great mediums of the past, we found that there were changes um, known as planetary eclipses and planetary quads of uh, planetary movements where planets moved forward a time in a very specific way in the sky. Uh, in particular, we saw uh, Pluto again, we saw Neptune, but also, oddly enough, Uranus. When Uranus moves with Pluto in a specific way, when any other two planets, when a person's born, it tends to point toward a quad, which is a, almost pathognomonic for mediumship ability. Another thing that we saw was a Sun-Venus eclipse, where the Sun is parallel and um, 
moving in sort of a, a conjunctive uh, arena mathematically to Venus. And it, when you add that with the quad, that was one of the 15 or 16 different planetary movements that pointed toward uh, beginning of uh, mediumship ability. The algorithm uh, essentially assigned a point value to the 15 or 16 different planetary movements. And the more of these values that you had, the stronger your ability tended to be. So we then uh, blinded the study and looked at a number of people who had different types of abilities um, who weren't really in the initial study. And it showed that these folks, compared to normal people, had scores three or four times, uh, sometimes five or six times above normal. Wow. So what are you working on at the moment, Dr. Gibson, if you're able to tell us? Because I know that you were planning to write a series of the books, the signs book. So you did signs of mental illness and then signs of spiritual ability, and you plan to do others. What's next for you? Well, after I did the second book, um, I started, I really saw that consciousness and the universe around us were linked. After I saw enough planetary movements indicating or pointing to different states of consciousness being different spiritual gifts, I thought to myself, why is it that I'm not developing my own spiritual gifts? Why is it that I'm focusing so much on my mind and what I could do with intellect? Why am I not going deeper? So I actually stopped doing astrology astrology research, I still use astrology, but I focus more on deep meditation. Um, I focus more on using meditation as a tool to dive as deeply into my consciousness as I could to explore what it meant to have a soul and to see if I could see the soul and use consciousness as a tool to explore my own inner universe. And that is the work that I've been doing for the last 10 years, as a matter of fact. Wonderful. Well, I want to ask you more about that. We're going to take a short commercial break, Dr. Gibson, and we'll be back to continue the interesting discussion. Okay. A new era in psychic services has begun. Psychicaccess.com. You can connect with our psychic advisors by telephone or chat 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All of our psychic advisors are interviewed, fully verified, and accuracy tested, assuring you quality service. We're living in some very troubled times right now. More and more, the world's problems are affecting us on a personal level. You don't have to deal with this alone. Our highly accurate psychics, caring advisors, and talented mediums can help with situations you are currently experiencing and can let you know what the future may hold for you. All new customers get a free six-minute reading. All you have to do is register. Why not visit us now and get a free reading at PsychicAccess.com? Yeah. Well, Dr. Gibson, I want to ask you more about meditation. So we've, we've talked a lot about astrology, and then you said that in order to explore and further your spiritual abilities, you went down the route of meditation. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences with meditation? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. I, I, I read a book by Swami Rama uh, called The Path of Light and Fire. And in that book, he described a deep meditation process called the breath of fire wherein a person uh, breathes in a certain pattern while in a meditative state, and it allows for the energy centers in the body to open in a, a very phenomenal way. In using the breath of fire, I discovered that not only could I leave my body, but I could also control to a certain extent where I could go with leaving my body. It gave me sort of um, more rocket fuel, so to speak. And in doing that, I began to travel around the planet initially, and then I began to travel outside the planet. And I found that there were other people traveling around and outside of the planet in the same way. And I met a number of beings, some of whom were not human. Now, initially, 
as I was doing this, I thought, okay, this must be some sort of imaginary state. You're making this up. You want to do it so badly that you're sort of forcing these visions on yourself. But I found that these beings had nothing to do with my consciousness, and they were just as curious about me as I was about them. And then I found that I hadn't been able to distinguish inner journeying from outer journeying. And then I found, as I continued to meditate, that there was no difference between the two, that the outer worlds of consciousness and the inner worlds of consciousness all emanate from a, a consistent uh, conjoined point um, that I call collective consciousness. In, in just the way that Jung described it, we all emanate from a collective consciousness that we differentiate as outer and inner, but in the working universe, that differentiation is totally uh, without merit. It's totally artificial. And so I as I meditated, when I, when I moved to the states, I I was quite stressed, and I was going to see a massage therapist to get a massage a couple of times a week, mm -hmm. and I would just meditate. I would just meditate during the massage, and I came out of meditation on one occasion, and I'd had this most incredible experience of, of flying away from the planet. And the further I went, the faster I flew and I could see the other planets and the stars. It was just a, a, the most incredible experience. And when I came around from the meditation, the massage therapist said to me, did you just travel away from the planet? And I said, well, I think so. I had this meditation in which I felt like I was flying away from the planet. I could see myself getting further and further away from the earth. She said, I had exactly the same experience. So that was just so interesting. But have you found <laughs> that this does increase your, your spiritual abilities? To a great extent it does. I find that the more that I travel, the more comfortable I become with allowing myself to manifest these abilities. And I believe that we all have them. But society and um, family and government and politics, religion, all tend to suppress the abilities that we're born with. And when you begin to travel, especially even just traveling by plane or traveling in this world, you find that there are many people in the world that use these abilities, abilities on a daily basis in the same way that a lot of people drive their cars. I have met people that can move things with their mind, that can levitate, that can travel out of their bodies, and, and many other things that you just, it just, you just wouldn't believe. But I find that we have these abilities, that we have the potential that is much greater than anything that skeptics or the media would even begin to accept. And skeptics won't even talk to you about some of the things that are out there that people can do. And it, it really, for me, has been an exciting journey. It added an element to uh, astrology because I find that the planets are intelligent beings. They're not just balls of dust and gas and dirt. Uh, they are intelligent entities that form planets in the same way that our intelligence and consciousness form bodies. That the planet is their body and that when you speak with the planet, you're actually speaking with a being that has a great massive intelligence, no different than a human's except just smarter. Well, like that, that's interesting in itself, but it causes me to want to ask you another question about a specific planet. So we, we know that astrologically the planets have different archetypes or characteristics. Right. And that the, the positioning and aspects of the planets in a person's natal chart indicate certain characteristics, talents, abilities, and impediments even. And I read that the the term Satan comes from a reference to the planet Saturn. And I studied hermetic astrology in which we, we, we believe that Saturn is what we call a major malefic. So Saturn, whilst there are good things about it, it is a planet, planet that we see uh, to be also very troublesome. So when you talk about understanding the the character of the planet what, what do you feel when you tune into saturn do you feel that saturn has this connection to the archetype of satan well the the ancients were able to hear the voices of the planets they described uh talking to the planets as we talk to other people they also were able to describe consciousness as being part 
of the interaction with the planet. And when you when you talk to the planet uh, Saturn, for instance, Saturn has a very unusual voice. Saturn's voice sounds like the voice of a monster. Jupiter's voice has sort of a grand, almost orchestral feel to it. Venus's voice is beautiful, almost lyrical. Mercury's voice is very quick and almost as though you're listening to a very fast piece of music. But when you, when you listen to Saturn's voice, it's like listening to the voice of a demon. And so I think it had something to do with the uh, orchestral or the, the ancients naming uh, Saturn as a malefic. And oddly enough, when the Cassini spacecraft uh, flew past Saturn and recorded the electromagnetic emanations coming from Saturn, uh, what they found is that the energy of the sounds sounded a lot like demons screaming. And when you go on the internet and look under uh, on YouTube on the Cassini spacecraft, sounds coming from Saturn and listen to them, uh, it sounds a lot like demons. So the, the, the term malefic associated with Saturn may have some more reality associated with it than we might be comfortable in believing. Yeah, I mean, when I look at progress progressions, um, so looking at the progressed natal charts, because in hermetic astrology, we take a natal chart and we progress it using the principle of a day for each year. So we, we see transiting planets as triggers, but there have to be deep underlying conditions in place that can be triggered. And I've mm -hmm. noticed that uh, when we look at uh, progressions to Saturn, that are associated with illness usually that illness is cancer so there 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 is definitely some connection between saturn and some of the tough things that happen in life saturn uh, it does have a very strong sort of underlying negative connotation to the energy and to a certain extent that's well founded but saturn is also probably the greatest teacher in the sky in that the, the events that are created by Saturn, um, I find, tend to be heralded a year or two in advance before major, major Saturn transits. So if you're having um, a Saturn progression from the, the first progression of Saturn 27 years out, usually that event, before you reach your 27th birthday, is going to manifest somewhere around 25, 26 years old. The next one is supposed to be 54, but that'll usually manifest somewhere a year or two before you reach your 54th birthday. If you can, if you can recognize that those transits are coming towards you, you won't be hit upside the head and, and sort of caught off guard by the events as they occur. So we can use astrology to understand the energies that are coming, not seeing them as fatalistic, but take action to avert problems and also to em embrace opportunities. I, I think the the best use for astrology and understanding it is exactly as you said to use it as an understanding of our events but also to eventually rise above the effect of the planets so that your birth, your destiny are no longer determined by simply the planets but more by the effects of your elevated consciousness so that your consciousness becomes so elevated that the planets can no longer affect you in that same way. I think that's the ultimate goal of using astrology as a tool for elevating consciousness. Okay, okay. And I like what you said about Saturn because one of my mentors said to me, S Steve, uh, Satan is not a man with red horns. He's the greatest teacher and he made the greatest sacrifice. He stepped away from God to teach us the greatest lessons that there are to be learned in life as we evolve. I read a theory from a, a great Tibetan monk, and the theory really has made me think about reality in a whole different way. The monk said that in his studies, in his journeys, he came across a being that said that this world, this universe, is an experiment by the energy of Satan in consciousness that this particular universe was created by an energy not unlike Satan so that he could see if he could make a universe better than what the Creator had made. And that in that universe, suffering becomes a better teacher than bliss.
And that was his initial uh, journey, or that was his initial uh, goal, is to see if suffering could be a better teacher. And it was really an interesting way to look at reality, and it, it places Saturn in sort of a unique position of being the, the beacon through which we get our greatest lessons. Yeah, and if we learn them, then perhaps they don't have to repeat. If we learn them, we no longer have to manifest in this plane of reality. This place becomes irrelevant. We no Do longer you, have to embrace suffering. Yeah. Uh, I was always taught that we, or human beings, learn through pleasure and pain. That's how we evolve. But if we yes. can understand the soul uh, and understand where we have historically experienced pain, if we can move beyond that through self-discovery through wisdom, then we can stop manifesting pain in the name of growth, that we can grow through harmony. And ultimately, we can learn that the lower emotional states that create pain are counterproductive. We learn that even if we're going through what we consider a negative event, if we can learn to generate the higher emotions, happiness, joy, bliss, etc., those energies can dissolve what would ordinarily be states of suffering, and that will liberate us from this plane altogether. Well, you've got so much knowledge, Dr. Gibson. I could listen to you forever. You, you need to have a TV show. <laughs> I've often thought that. <laughs> you really, really, really. It's Now that Neptune is in Pisces as well, we should see a huge upsurge in interest in I would really, things I would metaphysical. Really and you know, there's not enough on television that is designed to elevate consciousness. Right now, the thing that tends to dominate TV is reality TV, but it has nothing to do with reality that helps you evolve. No. It's all about fighting and, and lower, lower states of consciousness, and you make a very good point. We do need to have more mass media uh, entertainment that focuses on evolution rather than devolution. Yes. I, I don't watch television. I, I'm very interested in learning. I watch a lot of doc documentaries, but I watch them online, and I choose what I what I experience and listen to, but I find television, well, I described it in another interview as the fog machine. I feel like it just keeps people numb and distracted from evolution yes, <laughs> and from yes, an awareness of what needs to change in the world. Yes, it does. But, you know, the sad thing is that as a collective, we have created that. We have created the, the machine or the medium by which Millions, if not billions of people are numbed in this way. And I think we really have to examine why would we do that to ourselves? Why would we do it and then complain about it? So it, it's a fascinating conundrum in, in the growth of an evolution of our own consciousness. So do you plan to, or well, actually, no, the question I want to ask you is, how can we learn more about your work? How can we interface more with you, Dr. Gibson? Are you going well, to write more? Where do, we, where do we go to find you? I have a website, um, www.tybro.com. Uh, and on that website, we have probably close to 300 products. Uh, we have books, CDs, DVDs, uh, lectures. We have seminars and workshops in many different parts of the world. And so, and we also have on that website just a lot of information designed to teach. And if you go to that website, you could spend days just reading articles and never buy a thing. But we have some products that really are designed to be tools for consciousness growth. One of the best ones that we have is called the Attunements. And the Attunements are designed around some discoveries I've made in sound and consciousness that just by listening to them, it elevates the level of your consciousness and your ability to go into deeper levels of meditation. And it uses something called scalar sound uh, combined with certain tones of sound that uh, we really are very excited about. We have uh, a Facebook page and just put in my name on Facebook. I have a community page and we have a business page on Facebook. 
And on YouTube, we have over a hundred different videos that are designed to be teaching tools. Some of the videos are an hour long, some of them are only a few minutes, but all of them are free. And when you go there, it can teach you a lot about what we do, the different lectures that we have, and a lot of the seminars that I've done in different parts of the world are now offered for free on YouTube. Wow. Well, I'll definitely be checking those out. I'm sure many of our listeners was, will as well, Dr. Gibson. Do we just search, just search for your name on YouTube? You put my name in and you will find dozens of videos on there. Right. I have uh, several new books out, one called Nine Insights into Living a Happy Life, uh, which is one of the ones I wrote about two years ago that uh, uses some really profound spiritual teaching as a way to help add happiness and contentment in life. We also have one called The First Darkness, which is my first attempt at uh, spiritual fiction. And it's designed to explore the concept of where reality comes from in relation to angels and consciousness. So it's a story that follows one angel who decides that he wants to fall in love with a woman, but he falls ill in the process, and he and the woman have to find a way to keep him alive before he perishes. So it ends up being a love story and an exploration of reality and the interface between divine beings and mortal beings and how they can help each other. Sounds incredible. Well, as I said, I've read two of your books, and I'll certainly be getting the I, rest and checking out those YouTube I would videos. I highly recommend The First Darkness. I think you'd enjoy that. Oh, I will. I will get hold of that for sure. Well, Dr. Gibson, I want to thank you for joining us, but more importantly, I want to thank you on behalf of Spirit for the work that you do, the work that you've done in the psych psychiatry field, but also spiritually. We need more people like you in the world, and it's absolutely refreshing to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic interview, and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I thank you for having me. You're welcome. We'll definitely be asking you back. And as I said, I'm sure many of our listeners will be checking out your website. I'll certainly be looking at your your work ongoing. You do also teach workshops, I think, don't you? Yes, we have a number of workshops coming up this year. We have a workshop coming up in London. We have oh, one course. coming up in Los Angeles and one coming up in New York. And you can find out about all of them on our website under Upcoming Events. Great. Well, I'll definitely be coming to one of those at some stage because I'd like to, to meet you and learn more. Thank you for Thank being you. with us. Thank you so much. Take care. Good luck. Thank you. Hello. My name is Res Miranda. If you're having relationship, career, or life issues, I'm inviting you to experience what it's like to have access to professional, highly accurate psychics and spiritual advisors you can trust to care and help you. Register now to get your free six-minute reading by telephone or chat. Get answers. Get access. Psychic access. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Psychicaccess.com. The season a person was born, but nobody had ever looked at the five major diagnoses of mental illness and astrological signs associated with them. And so in, in completing that work, I went over over 400 different uh, patients' charts, um, and I looked over hundreds of people from different time periods. And in doing that, I found that you really couldn't see the patterns in traditional astrology. You had to look into right ascension declination astrology to see the patterns. And essentially, you had to look at the three-dimensional patterns of how the planets move. Well, when you did that, the patterns became very apparent. And that's how the book uh, came to be. And I won a number of awards for that research. And it's something that I still use to this day. Every time I have a client, I will refer back to my astrology program to help read them. It's fascinating. And I know that most astrologers, when they look at the natal chart, they're looking in effect at the distance between the planets in terms of longitude. And so I, I, I always picture that natal chart as a circle. But then mm -hmm. you spoke of declination. So the, 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 where the planet is actually located in, in, in terms of the equator. And so really understanding a person's soul or their psyche through astrology is more like looking at a cylinder than looking at a circle. 
Actually, I see it more as a sphere. Okay. So that there is the, of course, the longitudinal aspects of the trines and sextiles, etc. But there's also eclipse. When I was in my residency, um, I was elected chief resident my senior year uh, of training. And the chief resident is the person that fills out the call schedule for all the other residents in the hospital in that area. Well, everybody, uh, I, I quickly noticed that everybody wanted to avoid being on call anywhere near the full moon. And it was such a, a big deal that they would try to bribe you so they wouldn't be on call the day before, the day over, the day after the full moon. And it was really funny to see doctors, well-educated people from Harvard, Stanford, Yale, people like that, places like that say, oh, God, Mitch, don't put me on call anywhere near there. And so it, it really raised my curiosity level. What the heck is going on with the full moon? And I did some research. Uh, actually, admissions to the hospital went up on the full moon. Um, the severity of su suicide attempts was greater on the full moon. Also, um, there were more calls to the ER on the full moon. So you just had a busier time when you're on call, if you're on call around that time. And so when I got into private practice, I extended my search into this, into um, whether or not, well, is it just a full moon effect or is there an effect associated with the time that you're born and the risk for having mental illness? Well, nobody had ever done that research before. And it was something, I, there was nothing written about it, basically, except that there was a full moon effect and that there were certain, there was a little bit of research done on schizophrenia. Um, and I did a copy of the second one, Signs of, of Spiritual and Psychic Abilities. And I was, as an astrologer, I was fascinated by everything you had to share. But I want to ask you, first of all, Dr. Gibson, to tell us a little bit about your 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 history because i know that you're also a psychiatrist that's right that's right i um <clears throat> grew up in the deep rural south in the bible belt of the united states <clears throat> and my initial upbringing was actually fairly religious very conservative very uh religious based but i asked a lot of the wrong questions when i was a child i asked about warfare in the Bible. I asked about um, <clears throat> the church being the sponsor for the Crusades. I didn't, I didn't really understand why there would be so much bloodshed in a foundation that was essentially the spiritual center for the world. My pastors didn't like that. My mother didn't like that. But it really began uh, a, a deep spiritual journey that led me to look into, I mean, a number of the world's religions. It led me to look into how the planet functions on a spiritual basis. And as luck would have it, when I was about 12 years old, a monk came to my middle school. And this was quite an event because my middle school was in a town called Ellerby, North Carolina, which is in the middle of the Deep South. So why a Buddhist monk was in the Deep South, a black school, an African-American school, I would never know. But he introduced meditation. And that changed my entire life. From that point on, I delved deeply into meditation. Uh, I studied Maharishi Mayas Yogi and Transcendental Meditation and a number of different other types. And I found that if I meditated in a certain way, I could leave my body. And at first, I thought I had died because I was floating on the ceiling and I could look back and see my body. And I thought everybody could do this. And at being an adolescent, the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to go see all the pretty girls in the neighborhood. So I did. But later I found that there were more useful applications that I could have for being able to travel out of my body. And it began a lifelong journey of exploration and meditation. And it led me to medicine. And ultimately it led me to um, exploring the spiritual world. Well, it's exciting to speak to somebody who's so well qualified in psychiatry, but who also is very open to metaphysics. I, I often find with some clients that it's difficult to distinguish the extent to which they may be experiencing some spiritual problems uh, and distinguishing that from the potential for mental illness. So I want to ask you, 
Dr. Gibson, I know we're going to talk about signs of spiritual and psychic ability, but I wanted to ask a little bit about mental illness because that was the first of your books that I read. How did you discover that you could use astrology to d- determine a predisposition towards mental illness? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Gibson. Dr. Mitchell Gibson is one of the world's leading authorities on the interface of science, the human soul, and the frontiers of human consciousness. He's the best-selling author of Your Immortal Body of Light, Signs of Mental Illness, Signs of Psychic and Spiritual Ability, The Living Soul, and Ancient Teaching Stories. And I've read a couple of his books um, this week in advance of the interview, so I'm excited to ask him about them. He's delivered addresses to many of the world's largest conferences related to science and consciousness. These include the International Science and Consciousness Conference, the Sivananda Ashram Annual Symposium, International Institute of Integral Human Sciences, the SGGRIT Conference on Advances in Electronic Medicine in Italy, and many, many more. Dr. Dr. Gibson's been a consultant for Fortune 500 companies, Hollywood celebrities, professional athletes, and the AE Network, NBC, ABC, and many others. His website is www.tybro.com that's t-y-b-r-o.com do check out his website there's a lot of very interesting information on there well dr mitchell gibson welcome to the show (laughs) thank you well it's wonderful to have you with us as i said in the introduction i i learned of your work when i read your your book, Signs of Mental Illness. And then I ordered 